Secondly, I offer my pranam to my Guru's Guru and his Guru and his Guru and all the great spiritual masters in our unbroken chain of teachers going back thousands of years to see Krishna himself, by whose causes mercy and its very diligent endeavors, the nectar of pure love for Sri Krishna descends from ancient time to this world on this very day. My pranam. And finally, my pranam to all of my very dear brothers and sisters. <laughs> In Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna has explained Purusha Prakriti Stohi Bhumte Prakriti Jan Gunai Gunai. The meaning is that Purush, that is the soul, us, the Atma, the spark of spiritual energy. We are now situated in Prakriti. Prakriti is the name for Mother Nature, the material energy. So, Purusha Prakriti Stohi Bhumte Prakriti Jan Guna. And the souls in this world, they are trying to enjoy through the physical body and through the senses the external world of Prakriti, of nature. So, Karanam, Karanam Guna Sangosya. Sadasat Yoni Janmasu. And because of the living entity's association with Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas, the three uh, modalities of this physical material energy, so the soul is taking birth again and again, sometimes in higher species and sometimes in lower species. So essentially, this Prakriti, this material energy around us, it has three modalities. There is, you can see practically that all things, they come into existence. They remain for some time and then they dissolve and disappear. Like bubbles in the ocean. Every body, every building, every empire, whatever. It may take one day like an insect can be born and die on the same day. Or it may take a hundred years like a human being. Or it may be like an empire of a thousand years. But everything in this ocean of material existence is just like a bubble that comes into existence, lasts for a moment and then bursts and disappears. So, it is Rajagun, the mode of passion, which is the energy that brings about the creation of the various forms of this world. It is Sattva, which makes some balance for some time, so they exist. And then tamas, the mode of ignorance comes and everything is dissolved. So the living entity is situated in, these, in this prakriti which has these three natures. So if you associate, depending on which guna you associate with, then 
you have a corresponding experience and a corresponding type of life and a corresponding death and a corresponding type of rebirth also. So those who live their life in Sattva Gun, very peaceful, very dharmic, very uh, detached, very self-controlled, then by following the path of Dharma, when this body is finished, then they take birth in a higher planetary system, in Swargalok, among the Devatas. And they can go up and up. Those who live their life in the Rajagun, passion, they can take birth again among the human beings. And those who are in contact with the mode of ignorance, being lazy, taking drugs, and um, fighting, becoming angry, all of these tamasic things, eating meat, all these tamasic things, uh, they cause the consciousness code to, to go down. And so that soul will take a body in a species lower than human beings. There's so, there are so many species lower than human beings. How, how far down can we go? Down to insects, down to the trees, grass. So, see, Krishna is essentially saying uh, that it's a chain reaction. We're acting now in this life according to the guna that we cultivated in the previous life. And in the future, the next life will be a consequence of the guna that we associated with in this life. So, Patanjali has given a nice sutra describing how we mm, attain another birth. And in principle, the entire unfoldment of everyone's destiny uh, is described here. He said, Jati Antara Parinamaha Prakriti Puryat. The acceptance of another birth is the result of the filling out, Puryat, the filling out of Prakriti. Now, like all sutras, sutra literature, you know, it's very pithy. Uh, very pithy, it's very brief, and it requires some background and some explanation. So what does it mean? The attainment of another birth, another life, another species is the result of the filling out of property. It's very wonderful. You see, this world uh, is manifest in layers, layers of cause and effect. Try to understand it in layers. And what we see is only the, the surface. Beyond the surface there's another layer. Beyond that, there's another layer and another layer. And each layer is more subtle than the previous one. So, for example, this body is made of the elements earth, water, fire, air, and ether. And pran. So, the physical body. That pran is the connection to the, the mind. So, the element of mind is even more subtle. The element of the ego is even more subtle. And the last element is called uh, chitta, chitta. That element, that final element, if you're looking, if you're starting from this world and going more and more subtle, it's the last element. If you start from the creation of the universe, it's the first element that comes out. Huh? See, these elements, they come out of each other, just like if you have milk and then you um, put something sour in it, the milk transforms into yogurt. Then if you churn the yogurt, the yogurt turns into butter. And if you boil the butter, it turns into ghee. So, all the way through, it's only milk. Milk is milk, yogurt is milk, butter is milk, and ghee is milk. But these are transformations, a gradual grossification of the same substance. And each stage of development has its own specific qualities, which are quite different from the previous stage. So in the same way, this whole universe comes from the element of Mahatattva, Mahatattva, and then comes the ego, the in mind, intelligence, the senses, and space, and then uh, air, fire, water, and earth. The elements come out like that from Prakriti. So everything we see is we see the surface, but behind it there's a cause and another cause and another cause, and they're arranged in layers. Is that clear? 
You have to digest each point because we're going to put them all together to have a very clear understanding of what's going on in the world. Okay, now, so the subtle elements are the cause of the gross elements in a sequence. Now, Mahatattva, the first element of the universe, and all the elements are also present in your body. So your body is like a microcosm of the universe. All the elements which are in the universe are also present in you. So the part of the Mahatattva, the first element, which is uh, in your body, the portion of that which is in your subtle body, your psychological body, is called Chitta. So when Patanjali is also speaking about Chitta, is meaning the finest uh, subtle element which is part of your subtle body, your pre-egoistic mind. Now that Chitta, or Mahatattva, it's the same thing. It has impressions in it. Impressions. And these come from experience. Every, everywhere you're walking, your cameras are filming everything. You have two cameras, one here, one here. They're filming everything and recording it as impressions in the jitta. And so everything you do, everything you touch, everything you smell, everywhere you go, it's all going inside and making impressions in the jitta, in the subconscious mind. Then, what happens is, in the future, then these impressions, they gradually, they echo back. In other words, these, just like, let's say, you walk on the beach and the sand is wet. So what happens? You leave impressions in the sand. So, if someone were to come with some uh, plaster of Paris and pour it, pour it into that impression, and leave it to dry, then you'd have a model of your foot. Right? So impressions are a particular shape, and you can pour liquid into it, and when that liquid solidifies, it becomes the very thing that made the impression. And this is exactly what Patanjali is saying here. Jati antara parinama prakriti, uh, prakriti puriyat that your future lives are the filling in of the impressions in the Mahatattva, in your Chitta, that is in your subtle body, and also in the universe as well. So the impressions in your Chitta are slowly, slowly, that shape is there and the other elements develop and they begin to fill that shape and as if there's a grossification through the different layers of an ontological existence, it becomes solid, and that's the body that you have now. So you should know that your body is like a, a, a cast which has been made in the mold of the impressions that were in your mind from your previous life. But it's, it's also the same. It's like a cast. It's a, so it's a model, but at the same time, it's also it work, it's acting as a cast at the same time, right? Uh -huh. Because well, yeah, but you know when you have your arm in a cast, right, the cast is the thing that you've made from the plaster of Paris, yeah. right? And so the jitta is the mold, the impressions are the mold, and the body, the physical body which is manifest, is actually that thing which is cast within that mold. Yeah. But I'm saying it's like, it's, it's a mold, but it's also an impression at the same time, right? Uh -huh. Every life, every lifetime. Yeah, well, what is happens, it? yeah, what happens is, now you're, you're living, and each thing that you're doing is making new impressions, right? Even though it's already a model. But those impressions get filled again with the mature energy and make your next life. So it's ongoing. Uh, that's, that's why every life isn't, you don't get the same birth or the same body in every life. That's what Krishna is saying. Karnam guna sangosya sada sadhyoni jamishu. Depending on which type of energy, which kind of experience you have, you actually make the impressions which become the mold for your next life. So you can be going down and after sometimes you can be coming back up again and then going back down again. So this material world is like a Ferris wheel. You know, if you get on a Ferris wheel, you just, you ride around. And sometimes you're at the top, so you become the king of heaven like Indra. And sometimes you come down, you become a human being. And sometimes you go down into the lower species, animals and insects and so on and back up again. So the souls are going round and round 
according to the association of the material energy. So, those impressions which are in your mind bring about the development of your, um, your body in this life and later life and the next body in the next life also. And the samskaras, impressions which are in the Mahatattva of the universe are controlling all the other things. Like that, because some of your karma is coming from your own desire and activity, but some of your karma is coming from outside. Yeah, let's say it's your karma to um, uh, discover a treasure chest or something. So one day you'll be digging, and but there it is. Someone had got some gold, put it in a box, and buried it there, and it was waiting for, you, for your fate to come and discover that. So this is essentially how karma, how karma goes on. The samskaras, impression in your chitta and impressions in the Mahatattva of the universe and they're all gradually, there's a grossification of the energies through those molds and it unfolds and that is your destiny, <coughs> right? That's your destiny. Uh, it's quite incredible, quite incredible. However, we feel subjectively that we're in charge of everything, that we're independent, that we're in, in control that we're making decisions in real time. But just see, when you make a decision, you come to a fork in the road, say, and you want to decide, do I go right or do I go left? What you do, you stop, and you wait for the, the, a decision to appear in your mind. And, okay, I'll go right. What should I do today? Should I go to the beach? Or should I go to the cinema? Or should I go to the bhakti program? What should I do, you see? So then, you stop, and then the impressions of your past activities echo into your mind and you act according to that. So even though due to our ego, we think that we are making the decisions in real time, but actually each person, the Bhagavatam gives the example of like a bull has a ring through his nose. And so if the master ties a, a rope to the ring in the nose of the bull, that just pulls him wherever he wants to go. So we're like that. We are being pulled through our destiny uh, by our karma. And this is what's going on. So Krishna said, Prakrite kriyamanani gune karmani savashaha ahankara vimudatma karta amitimanyate. That uh, the living soul, bewildered by his own false ego, thinks that he is the doer of all activities which are actually being carried out by Prakriti, by the three gunas. Only the material energy is moving according to past impressions being filled out and the destiny is manifesting gradually and the soul is sitting there dreaming that he's in charge and in control of everything but he's just like a passenger hmm, on the body. Senses are functioning, body is functioning, ego is functioning and the soul is just in a state of stupefaction, identifying with everything and thinking this is me. Hmm? That's why Sri Krishna said Naivakkin chikkaro meti a person whose consciousness is pure, he knows whether he's standing, sitting, walking, talking, opening or closing his eyes, that actually only the body and the senses are engaged with their objects, but he himself is doing nothing. So that state of consciousness is called shakshitra. The word shakshi means a witness. Witness. So shakshitra means witness Ness, if you like, witnesshood. The state of being situated in consciousness where not only do you see the world going on around you, but you're situated in inner stillness and you're seeing your senses going on around you. You're watching your mind going on around you, just like ocean, like waves in ocean moving. And so you have objective vision even towards your own mind. That is a, a, a Pure consciousness, <coughs> pure state of consciousness, sattvic, very high level of sattva. It is not the very transcendental, but we have to go through that state. In fact, Srila uh, Sanatana Goswami, he said that our practice of bhakti is not pure. Our practice of bhakti is not unmixed with karma, fruitive desires, jnana, the desire for liberation and yoksa, the desire to have mystic power and control. Uh, it's not free from these mixtures until we do bhakti in a state of shakshitwa, mm -hmm. witnesshood. Mm -hmm. uh, you see? 
So if you come to a kirtan, you're like, here I am, I'm gonna do the kirtan today. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's not kirtan. That's just completely being like a donkey. No. <laughs> donkey also thinks he's doing everything. Huh? Has ego. So this is not bhakti. But bhakti is pure when the heart is in a state of calmness and stillness. And we see the world is going on. The mind is gone. We're like a witness. And then we pray to Krishna. Oh Nam Prabhu, kindly appear and dance on my senses. In other words, bhakti is not when we do, but bhakti is when we accept the appearance of Swarup Shakti, Krishna's spiritual potency. Because the material energy does karma, it enjoys the world. The material energy also can reject the world in the form of sattva guru. But the material energy never does pure devotion to Krishna. Never. So if you're actually engaging in pure devotion, it means that the spiritual energy is coming and taking over, possessing the control of your senses and mind. So pure bhakti is like that. Be situated in shakshitva, the state of witnesshood, and pray for the vilas of swarup shakti. Vilas means play. And swarup shakti means Krishna's internal potency. Oh Krishna, may your divine internal potency manifest on my tongue, in my ears, in my eyes, in all my senses, in the form of Shavanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Pada, Sevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atmanivirnam. Hearing, chanting, remembering, beholding the form of the deity in the temple, doing puja, worship, giving pranams, bowing down, serving the spiritual master. All of these activities, they're not mature activities. They, they look the same to an uninformed outsider. Just like mm, uh, an uneducated person may see two copper wires and doesn't understand the difference between them. One is just copper wire and the other one is carrying 20,000 volts of electricity. Hmm? They look the same to your eyes, but they're completely different in nature. So in the same way, a devotee looks like he's singing, dancing, speaking, praying, worshipping. But those whose hearts are pure, are situated in the shakshitra, then it's a completely different experience. They're just in the flow of Krishna's spiritual energy, bhakti shakti. Bhakti shakti. So that's, that's where we want to be. So be introspective. Don't be satisfied with a mechanical or external performance of bhakti yoga. Try to understand with vivek, with discrimination, what is a pure, unalloyed bhakti and become connected to that. Huh? So, Shakshitra, very important. I want to tell a nice uh, history from the Bhagavad Purana about Shakshitra, witnesshood, and about pure bhakti, and especially about the meaning of the word yoga. Mm. Once, a great devotee named Uddhav asked Sri Krishna, O oh Krishna, can you tell me the meaning of this word yoga. So Sri Krishna said, yes, let me illustrate it with a very ancient story. Once upon a time, there were four sages, you may have heard of them, they called the four Kumaras, Sanak, Sanandana, Sanatana and Sanak Kumar. And they are the sons of Lord Brahma. Brahma is a very powerful devata. He is the Adhisthatri devata, the predominating deity of creation. He's a secondary creator. He's a jiva like us, but he's very, very evolved, very advanced. So one day, the four Kumaras came to their father and their guru, Brahma. And they said, can you answer our question? And the question is this, that the mind is naturally attracted to the sense objects, right? We, we, we're drawn to taste things, to touch things, to smell things. And at the same time, the objects of the senses in the physical world are also naturally find a place within the mind in the form of desire. 
So there's this mutual relationship between the external things of the world and the mind. So how can one become perfect in yoga? In yoga you have to do pratyahara. You have to detach the senses and the mind from the external world. How can a person become perfect in yoga when there's a very natural relationship between the mind and the sense objects and the sense objects and the mind? So they pose this question to Brahma, their father. It's a very specific and fascinating question. So Lord Brahma, he thought for a moment and he couldn't come up with an answer. He couldn't come up with an answer. And there's a reason for this. It's because he'd been involved in acts of creation which involve rajagun, rajas, the mode of passion. So as soon as you touch rajagun, the mode of passion, you lose your clarity. You lose discrimination. You lose the um, power to understand really what is the nature of spirit and the nature of matter. Everything becomes vague. So though the answer to this question is very precise and clear, but because he had just been engaged in some creative activities, because of a little bit of Raja's passion in his mind, he could not answer the question. So while he was in thought about the answer, suddenly Brahma and before Kumaras, they saw a light. And this light became brighter and brighter. It was dazzling like millions of suns. And then within the light, they looked and they saw a beautiful swan. So this swan was no ordinary swan and no extraordinary swan, no devata or anything, but it's called Hamsa avatar. Krishna himself, the Supreme Lord, has many avatars. They have Matsya avatar as the fish, Varaha as the lion. And this is Hamsa avatar, the incarnation of the swan, the swan incarnation of Bhagavan. But they didn't know. They just thought, who is this spectacular swan? So they decided we should pay our respects. So Brahma and the four Kumaras, they all bowed down. And then they stood with folded hands. And they said, who are you? Who are you? Now, you have to know that Krishna is very funny. There's a reason why people have a sense of humor. Where does it come from? Yeah, from Krishna. Krishna is the origin of everything. So Krishna is the funniest person you've ever met. You've never met anyone so funny like Krishna. So here he is. He surprised them appearing in the form of a swan. They don't know who he is. And he's appeared actually to answer their question, but they don't know yet. So they say, who are you? Now at that point in the, their career, the four Kumaras, they were meditating on the soul and they were thinking that the soul, my soul and your soul and your soul, we're all just one, we're one soul. So to joke with them, see Krishna in this one incarnation form, he said, well, if you think that we're all one soul and there's no individuality, then there's no meaning to your question, who are you? Because there's no me and you, there just is. Huh? So I am you and you are me. Huh? So he joked with them. Why are you asking this question? If all souls are just the one soul, then who are you? It makes no sense. And if you're not relating to the soul, if you're relating to the body, then everyone's body is made of the same five material elements. So then you might say, who are you five? Uh. But... You, the elements in my body and your body are the same five elements, so also no need to ask. So in this way, Krishna didn't uh, answer their question immediately. He's just joking with them, playing with their uh, wrong ideas to bring them to a deeper understanding. So then, see Krishna said, understand this. Jagrat swapaha Shashuktam cha gunato buddhi vrittayaha thasan bilakshano jiva shakshitvena vinishtitaha. Hans Avatar said, There are three states of consciousness. 
wakefulness, dreaming, and deep sleep. Right? But the jiva, the soul, is different. Vilakshana jiva. Different from any of anything experienced in these three states. Why? He's not those states. He's not those experiences. He is the Shakshi, the witness. Sakshi Plena Vinishditaha. He's the witness of the changing of those states. That is the Jiva. So when the consciousness is not pure, we always misconstrue the content of our consciousness with consciousness itself. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita used two phrases, Chetra and Chetragya. Chetra means the field. And Chetragya means the knower of the field. So everything you experience, that's Chetra. But the, the, the actual power of awareness, hmm? the, the experience of the knower of the field, that is the self, Chetragya. So he was saying, how can you find that? How can you identify yourself? as being distinct from other things. So he said, look, now you're awake. So when you're awake, you feel your body and the external world. But then when you go to sleep, what happens? You, be, you completely detach from the body. Your body is just lying there somewhere. <sighs> Sorry. Dribbling on a pillow. <sighs> Whatever. Huh? So you just... But you think that you're running around doing so many things in the dream. So now you have a, a, a mental body. And the senses and the mind are still functioning, but the gross physical form is left behind. But then when you go into deep sleep, you give up the mind as well. And the soul, in the state of deep sleep, is not experiencing anything. So don't, when you're in deep sleep, you're not unconscious. You're conscious of nothing. <laughs> huh? So the Vedas say the proof, the proof is that when you wake up, you say, oh, I slept very well. Because you have a slight memory of what it was like to be in deep sleep. If you don't, you know, in dream state you have rapid eye movement. And then if, you, if someone wakes you up before you go into deep sleep, and they keep doing that, even though you sleep and you dream, but you go crazy. You go crazy. You have to go into deep sleep and the soul becomes refreshed in the state of deep sleep, in detachment from the external energy. And so that's why when you wake up in the morning, uh, dreams are usually kind of, in dreams you get the, the change, the, short, the small change of your karma. You know, if you're buying something, you have $100 bills, $50 bills, like that. But if there's something very small, you just, it's only worth cents, so then you have change. So in the same way, you get like the dollar bills of your karma while you're awake. And you get the small change of your karma in your dream. And, uh, understand? So, dreams are, are usually kind of strange and uncomfortable. Huh? So when you go into deep sleep, then the soul becomes refreshed. And when you wake up, you have a memory. Oh, I slept very soundly, very nicely. You feel refreshed. So actually, it said that one portion of the mind, that is one 256th portion of the mind, actually remains functioning, even in the state of deep sleep. So, you are not anything that you see when you are awake, you are not anything that you see when you are dreaming, and you are not the emptiness that you experience in deep sleep. But you are Shakshi, the witness of all of that. And now, the Hamsa avatar, and this is a very important point, he said, so you are the Shakshi of all these states of wakefulness, dreaming, and deep sleep. That's you, the Shakshi, Shakshi, witness. And I, I am everything else. So that's a realization. The, the mind of ordinary person is not broad enough to catch it. If one is chanting, meditating every day, or by the mercy of a spiritual master, may bless us that we can accommodate. As Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, Bahu nam janmana mante jnanamam mam prapadite vasudeva sarvamiti sama asudulava. After many births and deaths, 
when we finally become filled with knowledge, one surrenders to Krishna because he has this realization. I am just the witness and everything else is Vasudeva Savamiti. Everything else is Krishna. And when we're not aware of that, that is ignorance. All the energy around us is Krishna's energy only. So, persons in avidya, in ignorance, who are not conscious of Krishna, they're like fish. There are two fish swimming along. One fish said, hey, do you believe in water? The other fish said, nah. I've never seen anything in water. What's water? Have you ever seen it? No. Nah. We're existing at every moment in the energy uh, of Krishna. But our consciousness is somewhat contracted. Uh, so we don't recognize it. So the physical world is the Viratrup, the universal form of God. But He has His own spiritual form as well, which cannot be perceived by conditioned senses. It's only perceived when the senses are purified and detached from the external world and invigorated by Bhakti Shakti. <clears throat> so then Hansa Avatar, he came to answer the full question. Now he just answered their question, who are you? But what was the question really in their mind? If huh, the mind is attracted to the senses and the, and the sense of, sorry, to the sense objects, and the sense objects naturally are attracted to the mind, then how can one do yoga? which is to separate the mind from the external sense objects. So then, Hansa Avatar said, no. <coughs> Yoga is not about separating your mind from the external world. Yoga is about separating you from your mind. <coughs> Understand? Huh? You see, we often engage in this struggle. Uh, I shouldn't do this or I should do that. And then, you see, we're on that lower platform of trying to control the senses and break them away from their objects. But Hans Avatar said, no, that's not yoga. Yoga is the, 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 the power of discrimination to become situated in that consciousness where you're not separating the, sense, the, the <coughs> mind from the sense objects, you're separating the self, the shakshi, from the mind. And Fixing the mind on Krishna. So this is the actual definition of yoga given in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Detach the self from the mind, then use the mind as an instrument for the worship of Krishna. That is called Manasik Seva. Serving Krishna by the uh, subtle body. So, We began to discuss in the beginning today about karma, how karma works through the grossification of the material energy in the molds of the impressions in our chitta and in the universal chitta, Mahatattva. We discussed this. First. Then we discussed the meaning of the word yoga, which Krishna himself has explained through this story, which is very purifying and shifts our perspective from looking at the world from the vantage point of our ego to looking at our ego from the vantage point of our soul. Very beautiful. So to develop Vivek, to um, discriminate between our, what is us and what is not us, that's one part of yoga. And the other part of yoga is then to fix the mind on Krishna. So we're coming to the third ingredient of our class today. Fixing the mind on Krishna. There was a great king named Prakshit Maharaj and he had been cursed to die in seven days. So how does that work out? This is very interesting. You see, because our destiny is the filling out of the samskars, the impressions in, in the Mahatattva. So if a person does tapasya, austerity, does hard austerities, then they develop the power to plant seeds in the Mahatattva that fructify in the form of a particular future, right? Because each moment 
Your destiny is the filling out of the um, the impressions, the mold in prakriti. So if a yogi has done hard austerities, then what can he do? He, by pronouncing a blessing. Hmm? You should become wealthy. By his tapasa, he makes an impression in the Mahatattva. And then it just fills out and you become wealthy. That's how blessings work. That's how curses work. So Prichit Maud had been cursed. The Brahmin boy Shringi, he had a lot of tapasa, accumulated tapasa. And he said, oh, in seven days, you've insulted my father. I curse you, in seven days you'll die. So that means that that person expends the power of their tapasya and plants a samskar in the Mahatattva. And then it just fills out and in seven days you die. Like that. So that's how curses and blessings work. So, it's, the path of bhakti is very difficult because the material energy is very powerful. And we have impressions of many lifetimes and just mundane worldly activities. So it's like, it's a struggle. Yeah, we say, I want to serve Krishna, I want to do bhakti, I want to associate with saints, I want to chant, I want to serve the deity, all of these things. But when you go to do it, often get derailed and end up doing something else. Right? Why? Because we have many impressions which are favorable for that. But this is why it's very important to have sadhu sangha. The association of saints to have a qualified guru spiritual teacher why because when we serve the saints when we serve our guru and please them by the power of their bhakti they bless us and that blessing comes in the form of vishesh sanskar a special impression in our chitta and then we become under the control of that you see so if anyone if anyone ever transformed their life and became a very ecstatic devotee, always engaged in devotional activities, then you should know it was only because their guru was pleased with them and blessed them and caused the appearance of Vishesh Sanskar, an intense impression in the chitra of that person, and then it slowly manifests. So that impression is actually Bhakti Lata Bij, the seed of devotion. And it manifests as a feeling of shraddha, faith. Faith. And, and, and faith is in, in bhakti is not... Um, faith in bhakti is... Uh, shraddha mm, anyopaya varjam mm, bhaktyun muki chitta vritti vishesh. This is the definition of faith. It means it is a special disposition of the heart. It's a chitta vritti which is coming from that blessing. It's a disposition of the heart which remains forever inclined towards acts of bhakti, forsaking all other paths. You see? So, Sraddha is the symptom of the bhakti lata beach, the seed of devotion in the heart. And the external manifestation in your life is called Sharnagati, surrender. That in your life you surrender. You're not struggling with the world, trying to create some special future for yourself. He you said, okay, I'm done with that. I'm going to live for Krishna. I'm going to try to serve Krishna, serve my spiritual master and please Krishna by my activities. And Krishna will manage everything better than me. Uh -huh. Listen. Whatever karma you have, I, I guarantee it's not that good. And <laughs> you see, it cannot, it can be. Uh, do you have any astro astrologers in the room? Right? Okay, if you know something about astrology, there are so many planets that, Im that influence the destiny of the living beings. Right? So are there more auspicious planets or more inauspicious planets? More inauspicious. Oh. There are more inauspicious planets. There are more planets that produce bad effect on people than those that produce the good effect on people. So we have to understand that it's the structure of the world that Krishna said, Dukalayam Ashashvatam. This world is a temporary place full of misery. Actually. Hmm? It's a fact. So even whatever is, oh, well, I'm going to have the car. No. There are more inauspicious planets than auspicious ones, so you're going to suffer more than you're going to enjoy. It's a fact. So just give up on that and surrender. 
Oh Krishna, everything belongs to you. Hmm? My body belongs to you, my activities, my time, everything is yours. Even my own soul doesn't belong to me, my soul belongs to you. Sorry. If you see Gordi Thai, they always like this. Hmm. Hmm? Hands in the air. That means they're dancing in the spirit of... Hands in the air dancing means dancing in the spirit of surrender. Hmm? So, uh, that is the sign. When by the association of Guru, he's pleased and he gives a blessing, boom. And it causes Vishesh Sanskar, an impression in your Chitta, and then your life just flows and you just start hearing, chanting, remembering, going to Vrindavan, going to Navadip, going to Puri, and always engaged in Seva. It's just by blessing. By the power of Guru's Bhakti, he can do that. It's not by his tapasya. tapasya uh, by Tapasya, someone can give a blessing that you have some sattva goon in your life. Uh, but only by the power of Bhakti can a person give the Vishesh Sanskar that causes one to engage in pure Bhakti, not mixed with anything else. Uh, so it's, it's quite amazing, amazing subject. If you can understand how karma unfolds, then you can understand how, there are, how curses and blessings work. And if you understand how cursings and blessings work, you can understand how bhakti only takes place when we receive the blessing of a sadhu, of a pure devotee. Because the, in principle it's similar, but the, in bhakti it's the spiritual energy at work, not the material energy. So, there was a king. His name was Prikshit Maharaj. He got cursed. You have to die in seven days. Just finish that little digression and come back. <laughs> On to script. So, He's going to die in seven days, so he leaves everything, goes out and sits on the bank of the Ganges, and there are many sages there, and amongst them one great sage came named Shukadeva Goswami. And Shukadeva Goswami sat down and bowed down to him, and he said, please tell me, what is the duty of a person who will die right now? And what is the duty of a person who will die after some time? So he's covered all the bases there. Either you're going to die right now, or you're going to die later. Right? So what's the duty of these two types of people? So Shukadeva Goswami said, Eitanya vidyamananam, ichatama kutobhayam, yoginam nirpanenitam, harinam anukirtanam. If you are a yogi, if you are a jnani, if you are just a, a bogi, you know bogi? Bogi means who's doing bog sense enjoyment. So a yogi controls his senses and a bogi indulges his senses. It's the opposite. Two of it. So whether a yogi, a bogi, or a rogi, you know, if you try to enjoy your senses, then after some time you, you become sick, you get diseases as well. So bogies become rogis and they never become yogis. <laughs> so whatever you are, everyone in every walk of life, Harinamanu Sankirtanam, Harinamanu Kirtanam, you should just chant the holy names. That was his answer for someone who will die just right now. Just chant the name of God and the holy name will take you beyond this world. Okay. But then he said, if someone has some time, then you should listen to Harikata, the pastimes of Krishna. Why? Because yes, the name can give you mukti liberation. But if you hear about the pastimes of Krishna, then uh, you will develop a particular relationship of love with Him. Hmm? When you have, a, when you're fixed in a particular relationship with Krishna, then when you chant, that's called Shuddha Naam, the pure name, and it gives praying and carries you to Krishna's eternal pastimes. So, if if you're just going to die right now, chant Hare Krishna, and if you have some time, you should chant every day. But make the time to be with sadhus and hear about Krishna's pastimes. And that's the second part of yoga, right? We discussed the first part of yoga is not to detach your mind from the world, but detach you from the mind and then engage your mind in absorption in Krishna. That comes by hearing his pastimes. So, let's see how we do it. So I want to give a little example of that second aspect of yoga, how to absorb the mind. 
and you can experience it directly for yourself by describing one beautiful pastime. Krishna does pastimes in three ages. He has his uh, infancy when he's a little toddler, little baby, those pastimes. And then he's, in those pastimes, they're pastimes of Vatsalya Ras, motherly love. Yeah? Motherly or fatherly love, he relishes that in the young age. Then when he's a boy, he goes out to the forest with his friends and there he relishes the Sakyaras, the love of friendship. And then when he becomes an adolescent, Kishore, he relishes the Madurasa, romantic love. So I just want to give a small example from the first pastimes, the infancy, the parental mood of love. And tonight at uh, 7, 7.30 at the ashram, Paramahansa Swami's ashram, I'll uh, bring the temple. Bring the the Brinda temple. We're going to the Brinda temple. It's only about 20 minutes away. I'll speak this evening about Madhuras, the romantic pastimes of Krishna. So we'll just, we'll just start at the beginning now. Yeah. There was a beautiful poet in Braja about 500 years ago. His name was Rasa Khan, who was born a Muslim. But just by the influence of the, the dust of Vrindavan and the pure devotees there, he became fully absorbed in love for Krishna. So he wrote a poem. Shesha Mahesha Ganesha Dinesha Suresha Yahi Nirantar Gawe Yahi Anadi Ananta Kanda Acheda Aveda Subeda Batawe And now the say Sukha Vyasarati Pachi Harito Puniparna Pawe Tahi Ahi Ki Chohariya Chachpar Chachpe Nachana Chawe He say Shesh, Mahesh, Ganesh, Dinesh, Shuresh. Shesh means the hooded serpent, Ananta Shesh. Ganesh, we all know Ganesh, right? Mahesh means Lord Shiva. Dinesh, the sun god, Surya Dev. Suresh, Indra, the king of heaven. All of them, Nirantara mm Gawe, -hmm. they're always glorifying the supreme truth. What is that supreme truth? Yahi anadi ananta akanda abeda subeda means that supreme truth has no beginning, no end, is indivisible. Akanda, unbreakable, imperishable, non dual. Yahi ananta akanta ananta akanda acheda abeda subeda batawe. And that truth is glorified throughout the Vedas. Narada Sei Sukhavyasarate Narad Muni glorified that ultimate, indivisible, unbreakable, beginningless, endless truth to Vyasadev. And Vyasadev described that truth to Shukadev. And all of them were glorifying him until they were sweating and they were perspiring and they became exhausted. But still they could not come to the end of his glories. So that supreme truth in Braja has the form of a little baby and the coward ladies there, the villagers, they take some chat, some buttermilk in their hand and they say, Oh Lala, if you dance, I'll give you some chat. So chat pat chat pe na chana chawe. That ultimate all-powerful reality is like a little baby dancing for a palmful of buttermilk in Braj. Oh, how sweet. So Shukadev Goswami, he said, Gopi B is to be told that the Bhagavan Balabat Kochit would gaiety Kochin Bugdas Tadda Baso Daruyan Travat. Though Krishna is Ishwara, the control of all existence, in Vrindavan he is like a puppet, a little puppet in the hands of the elderly gopis. And they tell him, Oh, Krishna, if you will sing, I'll give you a ladu. And baby Krishna goes, Oh. <laughs> and he gets some saliva comes on his tongue. And then he sings a song. Sometimes they used to say, tell Krishna and his brother Balaram, who is the strongest? Krishna, I am the strongest. And little Balaram said, I am the strongest. Okay, then you should wrestle. And they would clap and Krishna and Balaram would wrestle with each other. So when Nanda Maharaj used to come back from working, 
and he would return to the palace. Then Madhya Yashoda would say, Oh, your, Krishna, your father has come home. And Krishna would take his father's shoes, take his father's wooden shoes on his head and come carry them like this and present his father's shoes. Very loving and obedient, sometimes obedient. <laughs> sometimes he was naughty as well. So Krishna is playing like this in Vrindavan. One day, Krishna was in the kitchen and he was a little child and he was playing with a, a pile of rice grain. And like children play in a sand pit. You know, and they make they make a house, they make a road, and then they destroy it again. Because uh, in Vedanta Sutra he said, Janma Dyasya Yataha. The Supreme Truth is He who creates, maintains and destroys. So Krishna was creating something, maintaining and destroying. <laughs> At that time Madhya Shoda, she thought, I'm going to go to the Jamuna to take a bath. So she told her friends, just keep an eye on my naughty boy. Make sure he doesn't go outside while I'm gone. So then Madhya Shoda, she went out and her friends, they were looking and oh, Krishna was peacefully playing. And while they were doing the housework, they were churning some yogurt and they're always absorbed in singing the glories of Krishna. Govinda Dhamo Dhamadaveti Govinda Dhamo that something was going on outside. What was going on outside? <clears throat> Let's just go back one year earlier. There was a woman, very poor woman, from the city of Mathura. And she used to go to the forest and pick fruit, put it in a basket, and then she would come to the villages and she would sell the fruit. So she had met with some residents of Vrindavan and they were telling her, oh, you know, Nanda Maharaj, the king of Braja, and his wife, in their old age almost, they've had a very beautiful boy. He's so charming. And when she heard those who have seen Krishna glorifying him, then what happens? If you hear from a person who has seen Krishna, about Krishna, something extraordinary happens. You get low, greed, a transcendental greed. I want to see Krishna also. I also want to see Him. So this greed came in her heart. So she thought, let me go to Nandagal, to Gopu, the village of, of Sri Krishna, and uh, perhaps I'll see Him. So she took some fruit in a basket on her head, and she went, and she went to the village, and she was going around the house. <laughs> follow, follow. Take fruit, take fruit. But she was looking around, she didn't see Krishna. She was going there every day for one year and she never saw him. So finally, after a year, she was loading the fruit in her basket. And she said, Today, if I don't see Krishna, then I won't come home. I should just die. Do or die. If you want to progress in spiritual life, you have to be like that kamikaze, do or die. <laughs> when you chant the holy name, today, please Krishna, give me your darshan. I'll chant and chant and chant. I won't eat or drink or sleep or anything until you give your mercy to me. So on those other days, the greed was not so strong. But on this day, she had that mood, do or die. So she was moving around the house. And she was thinking of Krishna so much, instead of saying, Fallo, Fallo, she started saying, Govindalo, Gopalo. <laughs> and she was saying Krishna's name. And when you chant the holy name, with avesh, with absorption, then tears come from the eyes. And there's an intense feeling of separation. Krishna, where are you? Krishna, where are you? So she became quite despondent and she sat down and she put a basket on the ground and she was just crying, Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. So now when she's chanting, 
Krishna ins is inside. So wherever someone is calling the holy name with love, Krishna must go there. Naham baasami vaikunte yogi nam briyena cha. Yatra ganti mat bhakta tattvatistami narada. Krishna said, I don't live in Vaikuntha, the spiritual world. And I don't live in the hearts of the yogis. I am where my devotee is chanting my name. I go there. So Krishna was inside the house. And he could hear someone calling. Uh, so he thought, let me go. I should go. And he looked and he saw that all those Madhya had said to keep an eye on him. There were so much singing Krishna's names that they forgot about Krishna. Yeah. This is the power of Sankirtan. The name of Krishna is more merciful than Krishna himself. So they were happy with Harunam and they forgot about Krishna. <laughs> so then Krishna, he got up from that rice paddy and he wanted to go outside. So he thought, oh, this person was selling fruit. I should um, get some, bring some rice paddy to pay so I can get some fruit. So he took some rice paddy in his hand. But when Krishna was walking, then his ankle bells were ringing. Madhya Shoda puts ankle bells on Krishna. It's not just a, a decoration. Ankle bells on Nupur is a decoration. But Madhya Shoda puts the ankle bells on Krishna. It's a Krishna alarm. It's an alarm system. Oh, watch out, Krishna's coming. Oh, where is he going? So as Krishna was leaving the house, his ankle bells were ringing and calling out. Oh, Krishna's going outside. Krishna's going outside. So Krishna, shh, be quiet. And his, his little baby with very fat legs. So he took his ankle bells and he pulled them up so they were tight. Here. And now they don't ring. So, shh, be quiet. And then, see Krishna, he came out to the door. He was looking. And he saw that fruit seller sitting like this. So he snook up on the fruit seller. And he touched her. Faldo, 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 give me fruit, give me fruit. So then the fruit seller, she looked up and she saw Krishna standing there. So sweet, so beautiful. Adaram Maduram Nayanam Maduram Hasitam Maduram Gamana Madhur Everything about Krishna Sweet Madhuradipate Akilam Maduram When she saw him, she went his beauty was so intense she went into a trance. His body is so soft, his lips are red like bimba fruit, his eyes are like lotus petals, and he was reaching out with his hands. Valdo, give fruit, give fruit. So she was in a trance and she could not move. So then Krishna poked her again, give fruit. <laughs> she came back to sense. So then she thought, mm -hmm. I am a fruit seller. So if I give you fruit, you will have to give me something in return. So Krishna, he had bought some uh, rice paddy in his hand, some husk in his hand. But because he's a baby, he was not careful to hold them. They had fallen through his fingers on the way. So only one or two were stuck to his hand. So he went like that over her basket. Here, this is food. Huh? She said, but this is nothing. Huh? So then she said, look, I'll give you some fruit if you sit in my lap and call me mama. So then baby Krishna was what? Yashoda is my mother and she is from a low caste and I don't know her. So I should not sit in her lap and call Mama. And then baby Krishna looked at the mangoes <laughs> and the grapes and the bananas and the strawberries. And when he saw the fruit, then he started to lick his lips. And he thought, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> Because he wanted that fruit. Eh? So then see Krishna, he was smiling and quickly he sat in a lap, said, Oh mama, and jumped up his Faldo, Faldo. <laughs> <laughs> she was so happy. It was the 
the greatest nectar of her life. So then she got her fruits and she all the food she gave and Krishna swore and she piled it up on him all the way up, up to his chin, all the fruits. <laughs> and then Krishna turned around and as he was going back in the house he looked back with a smile and then quickly went inside the house. And when he glanced at her, he stole her heart and she was just and she could not move. She was just drowning in the sweetness of Krishna's love. So the whole day went by and the sun was going down, it was getting dark. Some bridge buses were coming back from the fields. They said, hey, don't you have a home to go to? So, okay, I should. So then she took her empty basket and she put the basket on her head. And she was setting up. She didn't want to go, but she'd been going backwards and forwards every day for a year. So her legs were just used to it. It was the samskar, the impression. So she was just walking. In the meantime, Sri Krishna, he came into the house. And then Madhya Shoda came back. She said, was my boy well behaved? And they said, no, no, we saw from the window. He went outside, he was sitting in the lap of some stranger. And calling her mama. And Krishna was afraid. People are afraid of death, but the God of death is afraid of the name of Krishna. But Krishna in Vrindavan, he's afraid of his mom. <laughs> so Krishna was afraid, but Madhya Shodhu was very happy. She thought, if anyone loves my child like their own son, then this is, she, she can appreciate the love and the service of others. So she was happy. And so then she took the fruit that Krishna had brought back, and she cut it and distributed it to Krishna and all of his friends. And Krishna and his little friends, little toddler friends, they were eating. And they never tasted anything so sweet in their life. Because the bhakti was in the fruit. When you give something to Krishna with devotion, he's not relishing the offering. He's relishing the, your love which you've put into the offering. So they were very happy. Now one may say, wait a minute, little Krishna couldn't even take a few grains in his hand when he was going outside, but how, how could he carry so much fruit into the house? So the meaning is this, in the spiritual world everything is conscious and alive. So the grain, when Krishna was taking them out, the grains were thinking, oh no, after thousands of lifetimes, we finally got a position in Krishna's house and now he's taking it outside, we don't want to go, and they were jumping off his hand. <laughs> we want to go back in the house. <laughs> and when she piled him up with the fruit, then all the fruit were, hey mangoes, bananas, hold on tight, we finally made it, we're going in Krishna's house. <laughs> so that's how he couldn't carry the grain outside, but he could carry the fruit in. <laughs> so in the meantime, that fruit seller, she was walking, carrying her empty basket on her head, and she finally got to the Jamuna. And Mathura, where she lives on the other side of the river. She got to the bank of the river and she felt, Oh, this basket is so heavy. Why is my basket so heavy? And she took it down and she looked and she saw it was full of jewels. Rubies, diamonds, emeralds, sapphires, pearls, completely full. So much imaginable wealth. And when she saw that Krishna, just for a little fruit, Krishna had given millions and millions of dollars of priceless jewels in her basket. When she saw this, her heart was ripped in two, completely broken. And she began to cry. She criticized herself. She thought, why did I ask him for anything? See, love is like that. When you have love for Krishna, you never ask Krishna for and to ask him for anything that's like the most horrific crime because it is a contradictory it is antithetical to the nature of love love never asks love has everything to give and nothing to take so she thought why did I ask for anything and she just got that basket of jewels turned it upside down and threw it all in the river don't want it and she turned around, she went back into the forest of Gokul, singing, Krishna Govinda Govinda Govinda.
transcendental realm, Sri Krishna comes here and manifests his pastimes in Vrindavan. And then the persons who are of this world have a chance to interact with him. So that fruit seller, she was not one of the associates who had come with him, but she was a practicing devotee from this world who was being incorporated into the Leela. You see? So now she was wandering in the forest and just crying and singing the names of Krishna with a melting heart. Back in Mathura, people were asking, have you seen that Falvik Krani? That fruit seller? No, no, I didn't see. What happened? No one knows. She was never seen again. But my Gurudev said, it must be that one day someone was walking in the forest and they saw a dead body there. And then they thought, oh, we should be respectful. So they collected some wood and made a pyre and kept the body on the funeral pyre and set fire to it. And that was the end of the Falvikrani, the food selling lady. But Gurudev said, no, that was not the end. Why? Because a whole baki yam stanakala kutam jigang se apai adapya sadhi. If Krishna can give liberation to Putana, the witch who came to poison him, then what will he give to that person who is crying with a melting heart and always singing his name and always thinking about him? Something far superior than liberation. He must have given her a position like his own mother in Goloka Vrindavan. So it just means that one day she was wandering in the forest, she was old and Krishna called her, Hey Mama, come here! And a soul came out from her body and went to the pastimes, into Krishna's the eternal pastimes. So don't have any doubt, your life is to develop praying love for Krishna. So two things are there in yoga, one, first, be detached, be the witness of your own mind. Hmm? Don't try to detach the mind from the world, detach yourself from your mind. And then take your mind and offer it to Krishna by listening to his beautiful pastimes uh, in the association of Vaishnavas, in the association of saints, under the guidance of Guru, and daily chant the holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare Hare. And from the seed of the name, the form of Krishna, his associates and pastimes, everything will be revealed in the heart. And your own eternal spiritual identity and your own unique role in the drama of Krishna, it has a very big cast, this drama. And one of the roles in this drama has been reserved for you. Find out what that is in this life and go and serve in that world. But even now, we are like